What happens when a psychoanalyst creates a podcast? I'm here with Dr. Harvey Schwartz, MD. Dr. Schwartz is very accomplished in our field. He's training and supervising analysts at two different centers, the Psychoanalytic Association of New York and the Psychoanalytic Center of Philadelphia. He's chair of the Committee on, on Health of the International Psychoanalytical Association. He's the editor of six books, including Psychoanalytic Approach to Medical Care and The Jewish Thought and Psychoanalysis Lectures. And most importantly for our discussion today, producer and host of two podcasts, Psychoanalysis On and Off the Couch, and a second one soon to be released, The Mind, Body, and Soul in Health. Harvey, thank you for joining us. Chris, it's so nice to be here with you again. And I say again because uh, last time you and I met in a setting such as this, I was interviewing you. And uh, we'll get back to that in a minute because you've done remarkable work off the couch. But let me start where, where we are about the, um, the origins of the podcast. The podcast is really an outgrowth of, the, of Virginia Unger, the current president of the IPA. One of the foundations of her leadership has been to make outreach to the community. And I'm pleased to say as well that uh, Harriet Wolf, the next president, it plans to continue and grow these same outreach efforts. And the question is, how do we best let the community know about what psychoanalysis is and what we do? And I had a hunch that there were many analysts who were working, we call it off the couch. What does off the couch mean? It means that we learn psychoanalysis in the consulting room on the couch, which refers to psychoanalysis proper, but it also refers to intensive dynamic psychotherapy. So when I say on the couch, I'm really referring to both, since most of us do both. And there were many people working, as I say, off the couch, but they tended to not be very public about what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And you would hear stories about these people that were working in the community. <clears throat> and probably uh, in years past, they were purposely private because their work wasn't valued. Uh, a great error in our field where it used to be considered that there was only one pathway to do real analytic work. Uh, and uh, it's not that people weren't doing work in the community, it's just that they were hiding it. So one of the goals was to find these people in the community and let them know that we were interested in what they do and that their work deserved to be recognized. That was one purpose. The other purpose is to also let candidates know that in a career in psychoanalysis, there are many pathways. Yes, there are some people who mostly days gone by would see 10 analytic cases in a day and that would be their career. And it's certainly an honorable career. But most of us don't do that anymore for a host of reasons. And many people do work in addition to on the couch work. And one of the purposes of the podcast is to let the community know, to let our colleagues know, and let candidates and prospective candidates know that there is a vast field where we can build and build on our analytic skills and apply it in settings outside of the consulting mm -hmm. room. Do you want to tell us uh, about some of the topics, uh, some of the people that you've met? <clears throat> sure, <clears throat> sure. Um, We've interviewed people who work in hospitals, who work with dying patients, who work with cancer patients, uh, analysts who work with uh, addictions, with dermatologic patients, analysts who work in refugee centers, who work in community clinics all over the world, a perinatal clinic in Athens, a, a clinic for young children who've been traumatized in Tel Aviv, uh, in New York, working uh, in the, in the poverty-stricken areas of New York. We've interviewed people who work in classrooms of Native American children, interviewed people who teach undergraduates. My colleague, uh, Dr. Steve Rolf, who also interviews, his interest is not only in analysis, but he also is a business consultant. And he has interviewed uh, leaders of businesses, small companies, family businesses, and large corporations when they've struggled with illness in a leader and transmission to the next generation. That's an area of his expertise, and he's interviewed a number of people. What's unique to this is that they're doing this uh, essentially pro bono. 
I mean, whether it's actually for no fee or very low fee, this is not to get rich. Uh, and you can tell by the, uh, the nature of the work. This is work that is really off the couch from the heart. That's terrific. Uh, yeah, for, uh, the Taco Analytic training itself is so, uh, it, it takes such a long time that it must, there must be a strong motivating force within the person, not just to learn the, the uh, theory and technique, but uh, something that draws them to the work. And it sounds like you see that in, in each person that you interview. You bring up an important point about uh, technique. What makes this psychoanalytic? In other words, there are many fine, gifted, caring people who work in all these community centers um, who are not analysts and do important and vital work. And what we analysts bring to it is a question. It's not psychoanalysis. It's not psychoanalysis because the frame isn't what we know as the frame. The frame, which is not to be misunderstood as a literal frame, it's a state of mind. Uh, but it exists in our mind and in different ways in our analysts' minds. And how each of us bounce off and relate to that frame is a source of information that helps us tap into our patients' experiences. Well, that frame doesn't exist when you're out in the community, you know, serving hot coffee to people who are hungry. It's not quite the same experience. Likewise, the transference, uh, a vital part of our work, it's not the same when you're out doing things in children's classrooms. You use the transference, certainly. It's certainly present, and you are likely aware of it but you don't study it in the way that we know we do in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Likewise, action. Action is something that uh, we look to find meaning in and we look to translate into words. Well, we don't do that when we're out uh, helping refugees get settled. We are, we are doing an action. So given that we do all these things that is not particular to psychoanalysis, I've asked uh, this, the people I have these conversations with, so what is it you bring to this work that makes it psychoanalytic? What's, what's your special yeah. sauce? They all answered the same thing. Mm. And, they, and they said, I listen differently. Mm. As an analyst, I listen differently. There's an equanimity with the way I listen, and the I is them, I'm, I'm quoting them, they say, I listen differently. I listen with a curiosity. I listen with an equanimity. I listen with an acceptance. And you can't quite get to that if you haven't poured your guts out on a couch uh, for long periods of time and struggled with that and been received by someone else who helped you listen. Each, each podcast, you, uh, you're talking with people psychoanalysts generally uh, in the community who are uh, who have an individual example of that kind of work. Yes, everyone describes exactly what they do. If someone is working with uh, Native American children in the classroom, they walk us through what that experience is like and what how, how they work with the culture. <clears throat> if people work in Tel Aviv with uh, uh, a mother and daughter, I'm thinking, who uh, traveled from uh, uh, Africa through horrific circumstances and ended up in Israel and now they're getting services provided by a child analyst to help the mother and daughter bond in a way that was traumatically rent. We hear that story. So yes, it's filled with remarkable mm. stories. So, so what kinds of things have, have you been surprised by as you've been doing these podcasts? One of the questions I ask is what brings you to this work? And I tell people, you know, you can you could not answer that. You could you could say you don't want to discuss that on the podcast to to an extent that I had no anticipation of. And this is from conversations with people in South America, in Europe and in the States. A theme that came up time and time again about what led them to do this work was related to the Holocaust. They would describe they had family members that were either murdered or escaped. 
they had uh, come to America and were saved by America and want to pay back to America what America has given to them in contrast to their families that were murdered in Europe. Uh, people would tell stories about uh, relatives' villages that were wiped out time and time again. I had a conversation with someone uh, who uh, who worked with railroad workers. This is in a country in Europe. And when I asked him about, gee, just by chance, does, does, is there any particular meaning about the railroad workers to him? At first he said, no, it was just a good gig and he liked the work. And something about it led me to ask a little further. This is obviously not online. This is just the, between the two of us. And then he told a story, obviously, <clears throat> about relatives that were shipped out on the railroads. Wow. Um, so some of these stories made it to the podcast and some they preferred not to speak of, very understandably. But this is one of the things that has shocked me. And the image I get, and maybe this is sort of um, uh, a manic defense trying to find something, um, something worthwhile in something that didn't have much worthwhile, that it's almost as if the, the, the horrors of the war nevertheless seeded the world with healers. Um, it, it doesn't make up for anything, but it is in relation to, it is in reaction to. Um, it's sort of like when a forest burns down, there are, there are seedlings that are spread and a new forest takes root and grows. And there are psychoanalysts around the world that, are, that represent, and all their students and trainees uh, who are, have taken root from the burnings that took place in Europe uh, in the middle of the 1900s. Well, tell me a little bit about how you listen uh, as you're doing these and, and as you're hearing these stories. So you're sort of turning on me. What am I doing in this field uh, or in this? Fair enough. Perfectly fair game. Um, the pleasures for it for me is uh, I get to meet really special people, uh, many of whom I've stayed in contact with and, uh, and uh, have enjoyed meaningful relationships with uh, as a result of our spending time together on the podcast. Um, so that's been a great interest. Uh, I, I'm the middle of three children and uh, wired into me is this sense of connecting, connecting those around mm. me because I was always between, between siblings and between groups. And uh, I, it just made sense to me to understand, well, that's how this person sees it and that's how that person sees it. And maybe there's a way to see it to get that kind yeah. of thing. And, and this, I trace this back to an outgrowth of that, of sort of connecting people. Do you get comments on your posts? Everybody, uh, if you haven't, and if you've heard podcasts and you've been inclined to, let me encourage you on the webpage, ipaoffthecouch.org, which is the webpage for the podcast. <clears throat> Each podcast has a page where you can put comments. Do the comments steer your uh, upcoming shows? Every so often, someone will say, you know, I know a great person for you to interview. Most often, those don't quite fit into the yeah. framework. Every so often, yes. But they may lend themselves to this new podcast, which is really for the general public. What's the name of it? Do you know yet? It's good. Yes, it's called The Mind, Body, and Soul in Healing. And my first interview, which it'll be out in probably two weeks, the end of January of 2021, is fascinating uh, about the microbiome and child development. And this is a woman researcher who is a, both a clinical psychologist and also a major league microbiome biologist. And we have a lovely conversation about a, the microbiome in general, B, how it pertains to health, and C, in particular, how it is the medium of the mother-infant diet. Uh, Harvey Schwartz uh, uh, with Psychoanalysis Own and Off the Couch and The Mind, Body, and Soul in Health. Please listen to it. In uh, healing. In, in healing. In healing. Mind, body, and soul in healing. Please listen to his podcast. Can't forget healing, right. right.
Right. Okay. All right. Thanks Thank so much. You.